What's um, Adrian's email? Uh, I think A. Sampson. Uh, um, CS Works and Review or Cornell. CS or Cornell Review. Sorry, just, just a second. I'm a little yeah, distracted. Um, I Yeah, let me put it on social media. Okay. So what are you guys planning to do? All right, we'll What's send the you surprise? the surprise <laughs> is the following. I'm just gonna give you instructions just a minute. So yeah. Okay, so we wanted to have you guys lead a discussion on uh, Grand Challenge slash Big Idea for the Factory Community. Sure. Why don't you just step away from the whole broadcast? So uh, here's what we, I'm going to send mail to do. So I take a look at Grand Challenge for the Factory Community. Yeah. It's a short description of the broadcast. Yes. Uh, what is expected by success? I see how, how, how will this push the field forward and then which of the discipline will draw from? Mm -hmm. Um, so essentially, the task for the breakout session, for everyone's going to have the same task, it be five breakout sessions. We mm -hmm. need to come up with one or two slides that we can do. So, so, one, yeah, so, I think one of the grand challenges for our community is uh, how do we put architecture back to the center? Because, that, you know, like I said, that if you if you have folks in the database community doing circuits and FPGAs, why are, we, why are we even relevant? Yeah, how do, how yeah. do we make sure that you know, the community stays relevant? And I gave arithmetic as a great example. Although arithmetic would come back. I think it's <laughs> still so around. So you should use that. Yeah, no, so I'm, I'm going to send. Yeah. Uh, like I, mean, I, can, yeah, I can sort of Perfect. take this and then send you back what I think. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So yeah. then, but uh, there'll be probably 10 people. Too, so okay. Or, so just, people are going to sign up? You know, no, I'm, we're going to randomly sign. Right now. Oh, if you move one minute here, then will send me about this. Okay. All right. Hot cool. crap has a feature for that. Right we right. are <laughs> handing out pieces of paper. <laughs> Which has been happening yeah. on the past couple of PC meetings. <laughs> so. All right. Just a second. Okay, so okay. Then, uh, all right. How long do we have? Uh, we're going to have an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. And then a half an hour for everyone to report out. Report out, yes. Okay. So, okay. so, so random assignment of non-jet lag people, too. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Totally random. Okay, great. Here, I have you on just a second. Can you reshare the second link with whatever whatever you shared it with before? Yeah, I sent so it to Adrian. But my cartel of four people watching. There are have been eighty-seven views on the YouTube already. <laughs> you got Gordon left. I don't know. Oh, I mean, it probably was people like watching part of the recording. Maybe people testing it or something. Eighty-seven views is actually not bad considering we did absolutely no advanced preparation for any publicity whatsoever. Since whoever my Facebook friends are. <laughs> Where is it online? It's uh well you need a link but I if you search it on the Facebook page, Chris. is it on the Architecture 2030 website the links yeah so if you go to the Architecture 2030 workshop page there'll be a link to the YouTube channel which has the morning video and stream that's up already in the afternoon oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not me. I, I created a separate Gmail account just for this. I, I decided that I didn't want to. <laughs> um, uh, Louise is still trying to get the uh, stuff set up for the breakouts. So. Okay, perfect. All right. But well, you can set up. I'm going. I'm going to announce you. So an inspired suggestion from one of Louise's students, right? <laughs> But uh, I've actually gotten a few emails. Like people, a handful of people actually noticed. 
the funniest one. I got to get it. Move the camera a little bit. That's your look. You're exactly right. So I did a number for you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know what? We should make somebody stand at the door and hand a bunch of those out. Right, yeah. So the ones are great. You're sure everybody comes back with the ball? I can pretend we have one. Oh, yes. Yeah, so this is how we assign people to break up. Rabbit high tech. The high tech solution. We're avoiding people getting too close. Yeah, that's such a deal. Oh, my God. <laughs> So yesterday we had a dinner in that thing over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. What will happen? We're going to tell you that. Okay, that's We, yeah, because we don't Here, you want to give me a stack? I can help you. Here, why don't you distribute? Just mess that up. Here, yeah. Randomize. Randomize. Can you give me some? Oh, paralyze here. We have a match with you were an undergrad. I, I remember <laughs> I, I know you by name. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so are you, are you still at TMU? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Congrats. Whatever that means. Whatever that means, right? Yeah, check me out. Yeah. You go through a step there, right? I go through a step next week. Yeah, I think that CS you don't need a number, you don't need a number. has a separate promotion for full. The rest of the campus is full and tenure at the same time. So this is, I mean, I, I'm told that they treat it very seriously. Yeah. So this is not an actual decision. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that the first one is actually pretty important because after that, it's just yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. I believe that. I put, you know, I put the effort in. Yeah. Right. No, no seriously, I mean, yeah. we're only yeah. hearing yeah. the greatest things from you, so <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the slides, by the way. Yeah, yeah I'm actually having a lot of fun to turn Yeah, Andy Bryant, we co taught it. This is what's. Oh, I did? Yeah, I learned a lot from you. Is yeah. Randy is back? Is, is back? Oh, yeah. He's actually doing the big super. Yeah, they just they just super good. Yeah, he came back and he was doing assignments. Crazy, really? So he could have taught it with me, but he's like, I just want to basically set to yeah. to, uh, to kind of just learn the state of the art. Man. Yeah, the ideas are all the same. But just the modern. He like, did the assignment. Like, somebody did a program assignment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conceptually, it's easy. Yeah. Still, have to get down there and write code. Yeah. I was very, uh, I learned a lot. Yeah. I was like, you know, yeah. I got a remote not to ever not hands on. Yeah. So I've been coding the summer in response to Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. And Randy's, I mean, he's a great mentor, too. I'm teaching myself all of these uh, deep No. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to read the papers. I'm actually going to read the papers. He's also really good at uh, uh, letting, even though he's like the senior faculty member, letting everybody else in the room know you're in charge. Okay. You know, like, that's that's actually really helpful. <laughs> so he sits in the back. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because at first, I'm like, the first day of class, like, uh, 
and he was in it, and then my department head was sitting with me too because he wanted to actually learn about some new stuff. I show up the first day. Well, give him to Ashish. I mean, he's, he's managing the door at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Don't forget, you're on broadcast. Oh, can they hear us? They can hear us. We're oh, live. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're all saying things about yeah. people. Grand <laughs> challenges. How do you make sure we're uh, We're just going to see what I mean, look. Okay. We're going right. to see what happens. Right. Okay. There'll be five report outs. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> I think. Uh, with an hour and a half, there's only so much organization you can do, right? We'll, we'll have to fix it after the fact. It's even their four years, right? Five. Five, wow. Thank you, guys. Oh, sure, you have text for coming out. It's a long trip, so. That's good. Actually, I would have really liked to stay for this by the time I added up secret. Yeah, it's too much time away. Some of the stuff actually is going to say, I would do it. Yeah, like our actually. The So we did all the special Okay, 
So let's let's start, let's start getting his, take a seat, please. Um, so now, welcome back. Hope you all had a good lunch. So uh, we heard a lot about devices and technology in the first half of the workshop. So now we're going to start the afternoon with an applications keynote. Um, and so our speaker is uh, Kevin Fatahalian, who's a professor at CMU. He's been doing a lot of fantastic work on visual computing. I'm a big fan of what you do. So thanks for coming. Um, and one of the things I find interesting is that graphics has always pushed architecture to interesting uh, directions, right? So GPUs now today are yeah, really interested, they're widely used, and they were initially pushed by graphics and rendering. And now there's, this, I would say, maybe a second wave of, of visual computing that can also push architecture in interesting directions, and that's uh, what uh, Kayvon is going to tell us about. Okay? Kayvon? Thanks. Okay. So everybody can hear me okay? Okay. Um, so, so yeah, as, as Lee said, I've always been just very interested in high-performance systems that, that process pixels. And in today's, you know, today's context, today's talk, what I was going to focus on is I'll talk a little bit about the history of this and why graphics has influenced architecture. And then I want to, being this 2030, I would like to at least do my best in trying to state why we are very interested in architectural innovation going forward and what, what that's going to be used for. And so you can think about visual computing, which is kind of a, a new buzzword these days, as being three things. It's traditional 2D and 3D graphics. It's this new wave of advanced image processing and computational photography. And increasingly, it's understanding the images that um, are taken with all of these cameras. And the reason why I get so motivated about the application side of this is that graphics, like some other fields, but is very unique in that usually when we get new compute power, it translates into something fundamentally new. So someone that can provide me more ops per watt means that there's going to be some interesting value out the end of the other side. And that's always <coughs> been the case. And when I mean always been the case, I mean I can go back 40 years. And when Ivan Sutherland was, was doing his dissertation work, he was the one calling up Lincoln Labs, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where he could, what supercomputer was available to him to run a sketchback. And this particular dissertation, if you don't know about it, basically ushered in the, the field of HCI uh, in this one demo. And, and this wasn't an isolated incident. If I go another decade, and, and I go you know, out west to Park, where they were, this wasn't the first frame buffer, but it was one of the first frame buffers that was killed by Richard uh, Schell. And, and that sort of, oh, and by the way, this is the frame buffer. <laughs> and, uh, that, that is, and it's, uh, it, was a, it was a big shift register, actually. And the, uh, the Intel RAM was out at the time, but it wasn't dense enough to fit the 640 by, did I have it on here? I, I think it was like 640 by 486. It was a weird resolution. Something. It's was it up there? Yeah. Oh yeah, I did put it up there. Um, and so they actually used this this big the shift register, and you know he has the mother of all demos, <laughs> which is that was actually the first image that he recorded off of the uh, the uh, the image digitizing device that he had. And this actually led to his motivation was trying to develop the first paint programs. And Albie Ray Smith, who was working for him, ended up back at NY. Um, the New York Institute of Technology was very influential in the development of some of the technologies that led to Pixar later on. So I can keep going to, to Xerox, and it's not just about making pictures, it's about augmenting the human mind, and that as computers were getting more and more capable, humans were being presented with more and more information, and we needed to use graphics to organize and present that information to humans. And so many interesting system technologies were developed at, at PARC at that time, across the architecture stack, across the operating system stack. And some of the driving factors from that just to get pixels onto a display. And, and that's the mentality that a lot of the, the, the ancestors in, in, in my field have, have taken, which is if we just had more flops, we could do something fundamentally new. And, and that was the spirit of Pixar where their motto was, be able to render everything that, the, uh, that you've ever seen. <laughs> and so this was an early uh, picture created at Lucasfilm. 
by the same sort of the core four or five guys that ultimately broke out into to Pixar. It was called the road, road to Point Reyes, and so that render everything you've ever seen mentality, if you look at the acronym, is Reyes, and it was fortunate that it was the same thing as Point Reyes. But uh, that is why the Pixar's rendering software was always called, called Reyes, which was it's the origin of that. And that attitude of, if I could just do a little bit more, I could take the next inflection point or the next big step, you know, they took a few more steps, and you know, not too long after that, it was the exact same folks with, with very similar algorithms that scaled up to create to create Toy Story in '95. And at that point, the next big thing was a movie, or you could say, making digital characters come to life. Mm -hmm. And Steve was quoted, you know, at the time as we take an average of three hours to draw a single frame on the fastest computer money can buy. They had 117 Spark 20s. It probably wasn't the fastest computer. <laughs> um, but this attitude of do as much as you can has been very, very ingrained in sort of this field's mentality. And this tight interplay between wanting high performance systems and being very focused on the applications that use them has been instrumental into some of the architectures that have been. So if I go out to UNC in 1981, they're experimenting with ASICs back then and even compute in memory technologies to build some of the first frame buffers. So this was Henry Fuchs pixel planes in, in 81. And right at the same time, Pixar was actually thinking itself of, of itself as a hardware company to pay the bills. They were building what was called the Pixar image computer, which you would recognize, uh, I think it was published as CHAP, but you would recognize recognize it as a, as a fixed width four wide SIMD processor that had very advanced instruction swizzling operations to move between array, destructive arrays and arrays and structs. Um, you probably have heard about Ed Clark's geometry engine that was done at Stanford at the time, came out into SGI, and a decade later we see multiple geometry engines in, um, in, the, in the reality engine being enough compute to start having an interactive flight simulator or um, various other types of training engines. And so where are we today? Well, you know, this is an image that, that, that you know, a good game developer can render today. This is a screenshot running on the Titan X. Uh, this can be rendered at 30 frames per second if you, you know, you want to pay a video a thousand dollars for the GPU. Um, and so, yeah, so, so the Titan X, you know, I have, I have about seven teraflops of FP32. Um, this is essentially the same compute architecture that's powering the United States' its fastest computers right now, more or less. And it is extremely heterogeneous, is that a lot of the folks that are only programming in CUDA often don't think about all the other parts of the GPU, which I don't have a sense of how much area that is, but it's a very non-trivial amount of area, I can definitely say. And, you know, in a modern GPU, I have wide SIMD, I have multi-threaded SIMD, I have a number of custom circuits, and some of those custom circuits are not doing things like math, they're doing things like DRAM compression, hardware scheduling of all of these resources. So if we can take every flop that we can get, we're certainly going to go heterogeneous. And then we're definitely going to have to figure out some way to program these things. And so this community has always, from the day one, said that thinking about the application and the programmer is exceptionally important. And so uh, Kurt and uh, Mark Siegel back in 1990, and I think this, the first OpenGL spec was in 1994, but you can think of OpenGL not as a C++ API, but you can think about it as a domain-specific programming language for graphics, which allows code to be generated for one of the most advanced heterogeneous computers in the world. And when I teach Graphics 101 at CMU, I'm teaching undergrads to pair up to code up an application that makes exceptionally high use out of this heterogeneous parallel machine. And this pipeline, like being, thinking about abstractions from day one, meant that the same rough sketch of how to program in 1994 is roughly the same architecture, the same abstractions that people put program in 2016. And even when these chips weren't application programmable, we exposed them in a manner that prevented or, or helped the user, depending on how you want to think about it, uh, not violate some of the excellent performance properties of the machine. And 
like I said, like in my Graphics 101 class, I'm telling people to program a heterogeneous machine, but they don't think about parallelism at all. They're thinking about implicit parallelism and all the things that are easy to deal with in parallel programming. And I mention this because, uh, as I believe uh, <coughs> Steve said, it was these ideas, and in fact some of these people, that said, hey, I have this really powerful parallel machine. What else could I do with it? And it was folks like Ian Buck and Matan and, uh, and Eric Lindholm at Stanford that were putting in all the effort to say, hey, how could I use this compute power to do other things? And this is uh, Folding at Home, which at the time, I was a grad student in the lab at the time, and all of the effort was going in to make this application work. Because there was a feeling that if you could just show this application work, a lot of people would become very interested very quickly. And that actually turned out to be very true. And Ian did end up going to NVIDIA to do CUDA soon thereafter. And I would have to say that CUDA was 2007 or 2008. We're eight years later, and some of the simple things that CUDA got right, being able to launch code onto an entire machine, being able to abstract the SIMD without the machine, still are not echoed in CPU <coughs> programming frameworks. And I am not the biggest advocate of CUDA. I think it has plenty of warps. But this mentality of take the things that are hard to do and let's deal with them with programming languages and tools was something that was uh, very much ingrained in these folks because of their experience with graphics. So, Everything up until this point has been, I would like more compute so that I can simulate the real world more accurately. I'd like to render everything that can be seen. Or I would like to be able to depict and organize information for a human so that they can be more effective with their, <coughs> with their computing tools. And the characteristics of this domain should be really, really attractive to computer architects. It's we demand and want exceptional levels of efficiency, and applications will turn more power into more value. We, pack, we want chips packed full of ALUs, so we are tolerant of parallelism and heterogeneity and specialization. And the software developers expect to use their pipelines really well. If these applications are not using ALU pipelines above 50, 60, 70 percent of a peak instruction rate, that is a failure of the application. Uh, there is an embrace of domain-specific programming frameworks. Nobody is writing to the metal. There is a reliance on domain-specific compilers to generate code for whatever architecture is under the hood. Um, and that's true of an OpenGL and some of the more modern things. And it's also true of deep learning. And there are aspects of these computations that are fundamentally approximate, which might peak people's ears up, ooh, ooh, approximate computing. And I would say that that has manifest not as unreliable or approximate hardware. It has manifest as a willingness to change algorithms to meet the more traditional hardware based on the geometries of those machines. And so there's usually thousands of X at the application level to choose the right algorithm for the job. So given that a lot of interesting machines and a lot of interesting technology has been developed to sort of do traditional 3D graphics, it's sort of reasonable to ask the question, you know, over the next 15 years, what is going to be pushing in this area? You know, what, what is going to be pushing the, uh, the field? And I think that it's not surprising what that is, <laughs> but I'd like to spend the rest of the talk sort of talking about exactly what that might be. And to me, if, if the, the, the world, if, the, if our world used to be, I would like to render everything that we could possibly see. I think the world over the next 10 to 20 years is we would like to capture and re uh, represent anything that you might see or anything that a human sees. And there's sort of two reasons for that capture. One is to allow humans to communicate more effectively. And you're already seeing a lot of that today. And the second is to be able to record and analyze the world's information, which will never, ever, ever be seen by a human. It will only be seen by computers. Most of the information, most of the processing that we do will not be ever observed by a human. So I'd like to talk to start by talking about some of these new capture technologies, and then we'll go into what we can possibly do with them. 
So as you all experience in your own daily lives, that some of the if the if the big machines used to be SGI machines or Cray machines, the big machines of the world today are the big data centers that are cranking on the images and videos that they're all up uploading. And Facebook stats are now about two billion uploads and shares um, per day. Um, they use the term shares now rather than uploads because you'd be surprised how much transcoding they do on a share. Huh. It makes a lot of sense for them to actually compute the right, rep the right resolution on the fly, that is to pre-compute and store all possible resolutions for all possible networks, all possible phones, and all possible, yeah. Do you happen to know how much vision does Facebook do in every image that gets uploaded? Do they recognize faces in every single one of them? Do they have um, enough I, I don't, to um, I, I do know that, um, it was impossible two to three years ago to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was impossible because the diameter of the social graph is, is narrow. Mm -hmm. And if you want to really quickly say this person in the photo is likely to be two or three hops from, from mm -hmm. any person that uploads, you end up having to do facial recognition on a lot of images. That. Um, but that was two or three years ago. Yeah. And that changes very, very rapidly, especially with how fast deep learning has gotten. Yeah. Um, YouTube's at 300 hours of video uploaded per minute. That standard Cisco uh, VNI reports coming out to say that in 2019, 20, uh, 90% of internet traffic will be pixels, which isn't surprising at all. Um, and then there's all these other ecosystems that don't quite have the mind share in the computer science community, like Vine and Twitch and, and so on and so on. But, uh, but this is where all of the bandwidth and all of the, the compute is going. I do know that Facebook was up, sorry, not Facebook, uh, Yahoo two years ago, to answer your question, was definitely uh, running your standard AlexNet like object detection network on everything that came up. Every single yeah. image. <laughs> and is anybody worried about not having enough hard disk drive to store these things? <laughs> Mm, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't know, but I'm not worried about it at all because the second half of the talk, if you're worried about that, is going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and, and this is, and so that's a good question because images and maybe videos. Let's just stop thinking about that at that point because we are now moving into an age of much richer capture. If you've bought an iPhone six. Really, there's no such thing as photos. You press that shutter button, it's taking video. Right. And, uh, and it's potentially not yet, but choosing intelligently which is the one that you actually want. Um, Facebook is going in limited deployments right now with Facebook Live, where people are just walking around saying, yeah. oh, my right Facebook here. Live? You're on Facebook Live, yeah. Hey. <laughs> or, or YouTube Live, live actually. Me, live. Me yeah. a, YouTube Live. <laughs> um, right. And so, and I've actually been noticing a lot of kids in cafes around here are streaming video of their friends sitting in cafes, actually. It's really impressive. Um, <laughs> so there's, in one sense, is just to communicate with other people, the cameras are starting to go always on. And on the other axis of things is that what we are recording is going to get much, much richer. So um, those of you that you know, have been around Stanford, like when I was there as a grad student, all the rage was in trying to capture light fields. And a friend of mine, Bennett Wilburn, built, built this device, which I can't remember how many cameras are there. But he's like, well, the only way to, to, to take a better picture is if you just take all the pictures, and then you figure out which one you want it later. And so this was where two configurations of the Stanford camera, where you notice that like, I think every column of four cameras is going to a different PC. Um, and that was 2005. If we step forward to today, that type of technology is sitting here in, in consumer devices. Um, and so like this, this light camera is pretty exotic looking. <laughs> um, but I can give you like a really quick description of actually what's going on here, right? So um, does anybody know how a camera works? A camera works, plain and simple, by if, I'll just yell, if there's an object here and there's pixels down here, a lens, if it's in focus, takes all rays of light through a lens and focuses them, them down to the same pixel here. So every pixel is just the integral of energy through all possible paths through the lens from one point out in the scene. Which means if you buy a fancy camera and you have a big lens, you can capture more light, and that's helpful. So all of these fancy new cameras, and I'm stepping forward because these are not mainstream cameras, this is not what's in your cell phone, said, you know what? Instead of a pixel capturing how much light energy hits this pixel, let's capture one ray of light per pixel. 
let's capture for every pixel, let's step away here, for every pixel here, I'm not going to only record how much energy you get here, but I'll, actually I'm going to record where it came from. So instead of me taking the projection of this integral, I'm actually making a measurement of a single ray of light. And if you're a graphics person, if you know where all the rays of light are, I can simulate any camera I want via ray tracing after the fact. And so um, there are plenty of good examples of stuff like that, but what, what my friend Ren showed when he was building his cameras is, well, you can just, you can do a lot of the things that you traditionally think of as happening before you take the picture, whenever you want after the fact. Like I can choose a camera focal plane wherever I want it to be. He showed other examples that I can actually move the point of where the picture was taken to any place in that array. Um, I think actually from a system standpoint, one of the more compelling things was you could build really cheap lenses and put the rays back where they should have been if you had really high quality glass. So you can think about this as turning the physical back into software. And often, maybe with an exception of that we were talking about analog computing, often that's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, and this is kind of interesting because I can build a really high resolution sensor today. So you can imagine that if I want to measure not just one megapixel, but one megapixel times 256 different directions, I now need a 250 megapixel camera. But you might be like, whoa, that's, that's trouble. But if you just look at what the size of the sensor is in my you know, on a fancy full frame camera, and you look at the size of the pixels in my iPhone camera, which are really tiny, and I wanted to build iPhone camera pixels on a big sensor that I would get with a full frame camera, all of a sudden with today's technology, you can build a 700 megapixel camera today. The reason why we don't have 700 megapixel cameras is A, it's really hard to do the computation resulting from 700 megapixel cameras or moving those images around to Facebook. And second of all, there's not much benefit to you to having just a traditional 700 megapixel image. You need all these additional features that a light show camera enables you to do. And, and, and Lightro moving forward, in fact, actually is now building 700 megapixel cameras. And, and this particular camera for film, high quality film, has a pretty interesting uh, machine down underneath it to do all the processing, which ironically looks about the same size as the Alto under the desk. <laughs> and now we're in 2017. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so it's very possible to probably get that into a handheld size at some point pretty soon. VR throws another wrench into the game, which you can kind of think of in the same sense, is that um, I actually am not the biggest VR bandwagon person. But there are some places where I think it will be very, very compelling. Um, because when I think about VR, the right way to think about VR is as a new form of display, not as a new form of gaming device. VR will be transformative if it is the right future display. And in some cases, I think it really will be. For example, I think most people are watching live television now for performances and sports. And Google are building, built, is building these rigs, taking 16 different 4K video cameras from GoPro, and kind of like what Bennett was doing back in 2005, recording all the possible viewpoints that one could see the scene. So when I put on that headset and I move around, the information is there. And you can imagine that's a pretty hefty weight signal to be pushing around the country out to 100 million viewers, um, and also some pretty heavyweight processing on the edge to align and reconstruct the scene from all of these cameras. VR actually has some challenges even if we don't think about me wanting to look around. So for example, if I hold my, my iPhone out here, and I look at this, so this is, you know, you know, I'm, I'm older, so I have only a, an iPhone 6, so I have a, a 4.7 inch retina display, and I look at it at comfortable resolution. That's about a five degree field of view in my eyes. Right? So that's a, on, on average about 57 pixels per degree. If I put a VR headset on, or an AR headset on, I want roughly 180 degree field of view, and I want it stereo. Right? So if we don't do anything clever, and in a lot of the things in this talk, I'm looking forward, because we haven't figured out how to do things clever. But the raw fundamental display that I need is, you know, for each eye, I need a 200 megapixel display. And it needs to be head-mounted, and I don't want it tethered by a cable. 
So you can imagine that you know, there will be orders of magnitude in algorithmic innovation do not have to produce a 200 megapixel display. But the power of just pushing that signal over a cable is way more than the power budget of a mobile device right now. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and it needs to be at 120 hertz, not at, uh, not at 30 hertz. So, and then this idea of, of capturing all the rays of light actually goes into the display as well as the capture device. So the right thing to do is not put a screen in front of my head. The right thing to do is just recreate all the rays of light that were there in the real world, which means I can invert this process of these fancy cameras that I told you about and build a display that every pixel on the display emits different light in different directions. And when I put my head in the right spot, I see what I'm supposed to see. So here's an example that uh, uh, folks at uh, NVIDIA, Dave Lukey and, and company, developed. So here's a display that's a one megapixel micro display in front of every eye. And effectively, because most of those pixels are being used to send light in different directions, has a 146 by 78 spatial resolution. And so imagine I wanted to get to uh, 200 megapixel spatial resolution. There's going to be a lot of information sent to this display in the future. And so with all of these rich images, we're starting to do much richer processing of those images. Like, for example, I brought my Nikon DSLR to Korea, and I was walking around yesterday taking pictures. I brought my iPhone camera, which is a much crappier piece of glass, much smaller piece of glass, and a, and a much worse sensor. And if I just don't work too hard, and I take a picture with this, and I take a picture with my high-end Nikon, I will 99% of the time prefer the picture off of the iPhone. And that's largely because of the algorithms and the processing that's going on. Um, if you take that to the limit, you can start doing things like some, you know, like a good friend of mine at Berkeley has done. So, you know, I took this vacation photo and I didn't like it. Let me just fill in the part that I didn't like, which means people are, are relatively boring, right? He likes to, you know, uh, Alyosha Epros at Berkeley says, look, there's no picture you're ever going to take on vacation unless it has your kids in it that somebody else has to take. <laughs> and so he'll just go off onto the internet, find the picture that matches, even if it's in like another town and just plop those pixels in. <laughs> so he's saying that we don't need any of these cameras or anything like that. Like the camera in the future is just a GPS device. You just, like, you just need a, a compass and a GPS, and like, we'll just give you the picture. <laughs> ours, will be, ours will be a lot better than yours. But, um, so the, the level of sophistication is, the point is that in sharing photos today, we're already going to richer sensors, and we're going to be getting to need to understand what's in those images. And now I'd like to take you know, everything that I just said and, uh, and say, don't worry about it, because those data rates are pretty useless. Is that, sure, we're going to want to sense the world with higher fidelity to deliver improved content to humans. But in the context of a 2030 challenge, it's going to be about recording and analyzing all of the information, the visual information in the world, for computers to process. There's no way that anybody's looking at most of the pictures uploaded to Facebook today. There's certainly no way that people are going to be looking at all of the video streams around the world in the future. But those video streams will be incredibly valuable. And the reason why computers are going to want to look at those video streams is kind of do all the things we normally do in life is we want to understand people and what they are doing. We want to understand the world around us because of navigation reasons. And we want to understand societies or, or cities, is the way I like to think about it. And all of these use cases will be continuous and almost on. They will be exceptionally high resolution. They will almost always be mobile. And they certainly will be there for computers to analyze, not for humans to watch them. So I want to talk about these three different aspects of why we want to, why I believe that there will be a camera on every human, on every vehicle, and in every room or on every street corner, uh, regardless of how apprehensive we may be about that work. So let's talk a little bit about why we want to put a camera on you. Right? And, and this experiment has failed miserably many times, <laughs> and it has failed, failed miserably recently as well. Um, but there are many other technologies that fail that when uh, architecture catches up and bandwidth catches up and the time is right, end up being very, very successful. 
this thing looks surprisingly close to here. Um, and so the, the, the reason why I think there's going to be a camera on every person actually was like really hit home to me when I was, um, I got here a couple days early to, to sightsee. And so I wanted to go, um, to go eat in the, in the night market. Right? So, so I'm walking around the night market and you can better believe what questions I'm asking. Right? Like, so when Google shows the Google Glass demo, you know, you're asking questions about when am I going to be late to work and things like that. Really, I mean, we can start simple. Obviously, I want to know what does this say. I mean, that's particularly pretty easy. Just detect text, translate the text, no problem at all. I might want to ask the question, well, what is this? And it happens to be this mung bean pancake, which was the reason why I was there. Um, and that's also you know, not that hard. And I say not that hard as it doesn't work today, but this is going to work. Right? Like all of these uh, object detection networks will be able to handle this, no problem at all. But so, and, and I might want to know, like, what is she doing? You know, like, what is she putting on the mung bean pancake? And do I want it? Um, so these are the types of questions that the, the <laughs> systems are going to need to have an answer for. And it got a lot more subtle the minute I stepped into, I stepped into an alley, I went to a restaurant, I can't remember the name of the restaurant, and it was like a communal table. And so now I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> should I be sitting there? <laughs> uh, you know, is the woman annoyed that I am sitting right next to her? Because maybe I'm very reasonable that she might be, right? Um, why is she staring at me? <laughs> and in this particular case, there was a very good reason because I did not realize the drink that I ordered was what it was. And I thought it was a water and it was, it was something else. <laughs> 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 That's why she was staring at me. Um, and it's other things like, should I attempt to greet the individuals at this table? Um, I don't know if, well, first of all, I don't know culturally if it was appropriate to do so. But let's say if this was back in America, it might be, is it just an appropriate time to butt into somebody else's com uh, conversation? These are things that we do all the time because humans understand cultural norms and they have experience with them. These are the types of things that I'm going to want this future system in my pocket to be able to tell me, and I don't want to query it enough. I need it to tell me when, um, uh, when is the right time. So a future digital assistant, in order to handle the really interesting stuff, is going to have to capture and comprehend the extremely subtle aspects of human social behavior. You're going to need a lifetime of interacting with society to be able to appropriately interact with society. And that includes understanding body language, eye movement, social context. And that immediately drives up the technical specifications of these systems from simply just being able to evaluate a deep network on a high resolution image and give me bounding boxes for where all the stuff is or a segmentation for where all the stuff is. Like for example, let's take eye movement and let's take the simplest example of eye movement, which is where is this person looking, right? And with isocons and stuff, you need an exceptionally high frame rate camera. I mean, look at how, annoyed, how um, insufficient this 30 frames per second video is when you put an eye up close to a person whose eyes are darting around the room. So just knowing where the eye is is already a high resolution, uh, temporal resolution camera. But when, we, when we're having a conversation, it's not just where I'm looking. It's actually a lot more subtle. It's, it's you know, very subtle facial expressions will tell, you, will tell me, are you agreeing with what I'm saying? Do you think you know, I'm full of crap? Or um, you know, are, is there trust between you and me? This was a conversation last night. And so you know, we're, we're, we, meaning uh, the graphics community, this is not my work, um, are really starting to try and capture at exceptionally high detail um, exactly what's going on uh, you know, in a human face. And this is what I'm going to expect my camera to be picking up on when I'm walking around the room or having a conversation. So that might be a, uh, and this is sort of coming out of the film industry right now, but its real <laughs> use is going to be in a, well, not real use, but a very important use will be in a future mobile device. There's also understanding social context. So if there are multiple people, I can sort of judge, you know, here, I'll break, should I butt into that conversation or not? So this is a colleague of mine, or sorry, this is Han Bull, who's a grad student, but uh, his advisor is a colleague of mine, Yasser Sheik at CMU, and they built this, uh, this dome to try and begin to do the research to can we figure out algorithms for understanding social context. And so this dome is 480 VGA cameras at 25 frames per second. If you add it all up, that's a 100 gigapixel sensor at 25 frames per second, or it's about three terapixels per second. 
um, like LSST, all those other things, or maybe a couple terapixels, or sorry, a couple gigapixels every 15 seconds. This is a terapixel per second. And what they're doing is, is if you have all of this information, you can begin to reconstruct, for example, the simplest step towards social understanding might be the first step is understanding skeletons and facial positions. And notice that the system is doing this despite Yasser, who's the guy, the bald guy in the back, being completely occluded from this particular view. This is actually, they're playing a game of mafia where one person is, is meant to be lying. And so they're capturing facial gestures and motions when you are bluffing to try and figure <laughs> out, uh, is this something a computer can pick up on in the future? And their approach is, we need to capture everything first. If we had the geometry, if we had the, the, the skeletons, if we had the spatial, sorry, the facial expressions, then we have a chance of maybe teaching a computer to learn these things. And this is just an example of, uh, of what the, uh, the machine is seeing. Like, so those are all the points being tracked. Um, and those are all the positions of the cameras. It's pretty light out. You can kind of see where all this cameras are. And so, so Yasser did some calculations, uh, thankfully, for me for this talk. It's like, well, what is the limit? You know, what is the, and, and he's like, well, you know, so let's just say we're capturing a face. And, and he's like, 5 million vertices is plenty for a face. Um, and 5 million vertices you're going to need position, so 3 space, and you might want the appearance. You might want various aspects of how they reflect light and things like that. So that's you know, another 112 numbers. Um, if we're talking about facial expressions and eye twitches and subtle things, the, the research says that some of those effects are at 300 hertz. And so let's say we're going to capture that at 300 hertz. And let's just say you know, we care about groups of 3 people. So times three, right? So you know, roughly that's a 500 gigabytes per second signal. And again, this is I would like this to be out in the real world, running on everybody's face cam. Um, to give you another example, um, I had a student, I had a grad student, uh, and we strapped Google Glass on him, and we asked him to record his life. And he, you know, he literally dedicated his life to his research. And, and we did about 72 hours of recording over nine months. So 72 hours doesn't sound like a lot, but we had to do recording outside for some privacy reasons and stuff like that. So basically, it's like him walking to work and interacting with people outside. And so we, we got plenty of images over, over nine months of what he does and who he eats with. And, uh, uh, and you can notice there's different seasonal change. There's urban. There's non-urban. And so we said, well, if we had a record of of his life for, for nine months. What can you start doing with that? And the interest, you know, one interesting question was, well, how much interesting information does he actually see every day? <laughs> because our days are pretty repetitive, right? <laughs> in fact, like, you know, around here when I'm in Seoul, like, I can remember everything. So my brain's like, new information, new information, new information. If I'm walking to work in the morning, I, I can't remember every day that I walk to work. Like, I, I remember leaving the house, and I remember walking to the office, and everything else is thinking about the next grant, right? Um, so what we had to do is, could we quantify the amount of information that he sees every day, and can we quantify the amount of novel information that he sees every day? So this is super, super simple. This was just simply compare images in the appropriate feature space to all the images the camera had ever seen. And if the image was sufficiently unique, if it couldn't be aligned with something else, we'll call it unique. And if it's not, we'll call, uh, uh, we'll call it, we've seen this before. And so the trend is, is pretty obvious, is that as we record over those nine months, less and less of the information that we see is something we had never seen before. And there's two big spikes where this particular individual travels to different parts of the city they had never been before. So now the rate of information, where you can think about the compressibility of the signal, is now a, a feature telling me how interesting his day was. <laughs> right? Okay. So you can think about this as a compression scheme that's specific to the individual or specific to the actual camera. And we can start seeing other things that pop up, such as how does the world evolve? Changes in companion, changes in objects, you know, bikes, the bike rack moves, cars, different cars are parked in different places, changes in season, change in time of day. All of these patterns begin to emerge if the camera is always on. We even started to do things like, well, we've watched him walk around all the time. Can we just predict, given an image, without GPS, where, which direction he's going to walk next? <laughs> um, and, and so this was uh, the, the image on the left here is where he actually walked. Here is the image of where we're predicting he's going to walk with dots that mean he's going to stay in the same spot. And we're using all these prior experiences, which is kind of interesting, is sometimes 
the closest prior experience visually might have been in a different part of the city. Mm -hmm. um, but if he's in an intersection over here, he's probably going to do something similar than he did in an intersection over here. So without any sophisticated machine learning, just the sheer volume of the data is beginning to, some intelligence is starting to emerge. So those are some examples of why I feel like there's some strong reasons to make sure that there's a camera and an exceptionally high resolution camera with basically a 180 degree field of view on every person going forward. It's a little bit easier to make the argument why there's going to be a camera on every robot or every vehicle. And this should be no, you know, there's no, no surprise to any of the audience that with semi-autonomous or in the future autonomous vehicles, those things are going to be loaded up with cameras. Right now they are loaded up with heterogeneous sensors. There's a lot of interest in trying to get LiDAR out of that picture as soon as computer vision gets good enough. And one of my colleagues at CMU says a safe bet for replacing LiDAR reliably, just to make people really comfortable, would be 100 megapixel in front of the camera and 100 megapixel stereo pointing back. Which is not that big of a deal, I think, in a car. You get a lot more power in a car. But it is absolutely true that the vehicle is one of the most compelling high-performance computing platforms going forward. And by vehicle, I mean that loosely to mean drone or robot or vehicle. And so it's no surprise that, for example, our friends at NVIDIA are beginning to build mini little supercomputers that go in vehicles at roughly 25 watts. Um, just as a quick aside is that augmented reality, which is actually a far, in some sense, a far more broad technology than virtual reality, is completely dependent on the exact same localization technology. Is that the hard part of AR is knowing what to put on the screen, let alone the fact that I'm asking for a 200 megapixel screen. And that is about tracking and locating my head in the world. And so there will be a video stream on every person solely for that reason even if you disregard some of the things that I talked about. And if you take away one thing about locomotion, you could just think about it as it's just building maps. It's just building really, really advanced 3D maps. And that today we have the Google Street View car going around building a map, and we're updating that map once or twice a year. You can imagine every vehicle in every city constantly grabbing in new data, every drone flying around grabbing in new data. And these 3D maps are going to be reconstructed and be built, probably in the data center, actually, in real time. And so all of our navigation will be in the context of those maps. And some of the best work on, on this kind of work is the work that Steve Seitz and company are doing at, at UW these days. I'll push this a little bit further to why would you want some really, really high-end processing on a car? And a colleague in, in computer vision has been building a system called the CMU Smart Headlight. And I don't know if you've heard of the Smart Headlight, but this is its manifestation right now. Um, that is a, uh, so what that, that thing is <laughs> um, on that Nissan truck is basically a camera, uh, also a beam splitter in front of a camera, some processing of the image that's sensed, and a projector, a spatial light modulator. Um, and so, <laughs> Um, so the camera is sensing what's out in front of the vehicle. And why do we think about headlights as just light bulbs? We have projectors. Mm -hmm. Let's put the light where it's supposed to go. For example, let's only turn on the part of the headlight that illuminates the road, and so on and so on. Or let's turn off the part of the headlight that would be shining right into the incoming driver's eyes. So this headlight is always in high beams mode. It just always misses the driver's coming. Um, but it can get a little bit more extreme than that. So this setup right now is actually camera to FPGA back out to, uh, to camera because latency at you know, effectively 140 miles per hour, 70 miles an hour going in both directions, needs to be exceptionally low for them to know exactly where they should be projecting this light because if your latency is low, your projection can be simple. If your latency is high, your prediction needs to be far more complex. So they're trying to run at roughly 1,000 hertz. And, and what they're doing with this is, is some stuff that might you go, no. So imagine if you're driving in the rain, you're getting all this back scatter, right? And so the latency of the system is, is so low and the system is so tight that they are sensing where the raindrops are. 
and missing <laughs> Noah. <laughs> You're pulling your leg. No, that's, that's 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 not real rain. That's like like uh, I understand. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, but but this will work. Yeah. This will work. And uh, this is uh, Nvidia should get on the ball because they would love to use Integra, and they're using FPGAs because of all the overhead and just communicating. Uh, okay, so. <coughs> What we will be doing with low latency and high processing sensor on vehicles and to navigate and improve safety um, will also be very, very uh, compute intensive. And the last part of this is something that I've been personally thinking about um, in terms of like some projects that I want to get started, is if people are one thing we need to understand, we need to understand the world around us to navigate. I think the other aspect of this is understanding what's going on in, in the world's biggest cities. And I think about if we think about the vehicles, a really interesting compute platform. I'm thinking about like Tokyo or <coughs> Seoul as a very interesting compute platform. And this is not a unique idea. There are a lot of other folks that are saying, given the population density in the world's cities, being able to efficiently manage the cities um, is going to be a major uh, societal challenge going forward in the next couple of decades. And this is going even at the levels of the UN. And you might have heard of how many cameras there are. There's 6,000 cameras in New York City right now. There's, I think, on the order of 12,000 cameras in Chicago. I think there's 400,000 cameras in Beijing. They're claiming 100% coverage of outdoor streets now in Beijing. Uh, there's about the same number in London, actually. There's, I think, 420,000 cameras in London. Um, this was Brazil's command center for the World Cup last year. You see some folks looking at looking at all these video streams. <laughs> and I think the important point to take away is the folks aren't gonna be looking at 400,000 cameras. <laughs> like, they're just kind of there for the photo op. They're there for the photo op. Um, <laughs> we, we, computers will be looking at all these streams. And I think this is very, very interesting because these cameras today are basically the cameras that make us feel a little weird. They're there to observe for security and safety and those kinds of things. So, so those are some of the numbers I guess I already actually told you. Um, but th there's not a lot of interesting processing going on. There's maybe some license plate detection. There's maybe some face detection. There's nothing much else. But we're very interested for the same reasons that I, start, or I, I, I started this section of the talk with. As if you had a microscope on what's going on in the city, you have the opportunity now to write applications for that city that do things like improve the efficiency of that city, improve quality of life for its citizens. So a project that we're just trying to get off the ground now at Carnegie Mellon that I'm having a lot of fun with is we're trying to put a bunch of these HD cameras uh, on a few streets right around campus. And we're working with some partners in industry just to run, um, they're being very nice about this, of running fiber to all of these cameras. So we have plenty of bandwidth, that's not a problem. And I want to put as much compute on those, those things as possible. So I'm going to put, you know, I'm planning to put like a Tegra X1 or whatever's available next year. So I, let's say I have a teraflop of FP16 on, on every single camera. And all of this is running back to a, a data center at CMU. And so we're trying to figure out, well, you know, what applications will be enabled if we have this data stream. And so I'd like to try and build a queryable map of if I knew all pedestrians, all cars, all bicycles at two to three second, five second resolution, how could that dramatically change how we got traffic through the city? How would that dramatically change um, where the city puts its bike lanes? How would we, which uh, roads would we repair? Um, I would be interested in eliminating circling for parking in this area of the city because we always know where all the open parking spots are. You just go to the app, you say, I want to park in this region of the city, and it gives you a time and a place. 45% um, of Manhattan traffic is circling. Um, and so this is a non-trivial thing. <laughs> uh, so, so there's, uh, you know, I'm also interested in, like, could we reduce the insurance of everybody in Pittsburgh by 5% because adjudication of claims? Uh, just goes away because the answer is whoever dings your door, like we know exactly when it got dinged. At least we know you're not lying for insurance fraud or something like that. So this is some interesting technology. It's actually some interesting architecture in that we are we are trying to architect some hardware, not build hardware, but piece together hardware. It's more at the system level. We're trying to develop the software systems for this, and then we're actually architecting some of the social structure at the same time. 
So we're working with the mayor and trying to be very upfront and telling anybody that's going to come yell at us, involve them sort of in the process very, very early on for some of the privacy and sensitivity. So, so we're involving, uh, like one of the reasons I'm very interested in massive compute at the edge is that I could say, you know what? No bits ever leave the camp. Or I'd say no pixels ever right. leave the camp. Or no faces leave the camp. Or, or, yeah, so we're trying to figure out what are the right policies and what are the right technologies that we need to be able to make a claim and, we'll, and, and see if people are comfortable with that. So we're trying to do that right around CMU right now. So if, you know, if I was trying to figure out what architecture should be in 2030, I would sort of ask, you know, like what will the world be like in 2030? And what are the big problems for the world at that time, right? So, um, and, and like it's pretty easy to do like a back of the envelope calculation, right? So um, we're pretty confident that there's gonna be about 8.5 million people in the world, or in, in <laughs> that is a very bleak future. <laughs> there, there, is a, uh, there is a U.S. election. You so. were much more optimistic than the previous slide. Yeah. And uh, 61% of those people will be living in large cities. So in, in 2030, there will be 41 cities over 10 million people. Ten, yeah, 10 million people or more. Um, there will be 2 billion cars. Um, and there will be, if we take the number of uh, uh, security cameras in the world today, and uh, I looked at the, the press briefings, and so the, the market growth has been roughly 7 to 10% a year for the last three years. This is what the various companies that, that do this market research say. So if you extrapolate that out to 2030, 1.2 to 2 billion security cameras. So we have basically a one camera for every four people in the world. Um, and I think these numbers are really, really low. There's not going to be one camera on every car. There's going to be a ton of cameras on every car. Um, and so let's just take, you know, ignore what I said about 200 megapixels. Let's say that we're smart enough with, as we understand the problem better, to get by with 8K video per camera. So that's about 30, 30 uh, 8K video is about 30 megapixels. And let's say it's stereo, so there's 600 me uh, 60 megapixels on each of those. So that means that like the total effective capacity or the capture capacity of the world is 12 billion video streams. Um, and that's about 600 petapixels, or about 600 quadrillion pixels. Um, and if that's a, you know, 30 frames per second, uh, and so if I took today's technology, let's just say we're going to do the simplest video analysis thing in the world, which is going to run a deep net, an object detection deep net, which um, given all of the papers in ISCA this year, Obviously, this is you know, nowhere near what the efficiency could be today if we wanted to. But let's just say we do that. If I'm going to run on that Tegra X1, I'm getting about 12 images per second per watt. And if I try and run that on those video streams, I'm exceeding the total energy budget of the world significantly today. <laughs> <laughs> now, it actually, like, I, I'm not trying to be particularly dramatic because let's say we get that 1,000 X, so we just close you know, some of those orders of magnitude. And I can guarantee you that the algorithm side of things is going to give you five or six orders of magnitude. So if everybody just does their job, we're significantly under the power draw of the world you know, in, in 2013. So um, I'll pretty much stop here. But just some final thoughts is that um, a lot of the things that Steve was talking about in his talk about um, interfacing with the application developers or interfacing with industry I think that if there's one thing that we do very well in the computer graphics academia side of the fence is that we've always done a lot of these things. It's that if you're an architect in computer graphics, you don't just work with algorithms, folks. You know the algorithms. And so one of the benefits of uh, the, the limited domain has been deep vertical thought. And that doesn't mean that things are not layers of the stack. but Deep vertical thought. And deep vertical thought, I believe, has led to some very compelling point solutions that led to these GPUs, which then bled into the influence in, in uh, trying to push multi-core back. And once people were like, hey, it's not so bad. And you saw a little bit of influence back in the more generic processing, uh, more traditional processing things. Um, Everybody's like, parallel programming's really, really hard. And, and I, in addition to graphics, I actually teach the parallel programming class at, at CMU. And I have 150 undergrads in that class doing some pretty gnarly stuff as long as they're using some of the right programming frameworks, right? So this attitude of, like, we have a job to do. We want to 
get 85% of our ALU pipelines on this parallel heterogeneous chip. How do we do that? Well, if you want to be productive and you want more than one person on the planet to program this thing, of course you need the right domain-specific programming frameworks. And the right domain-specific programming frameworks are absolutely informed by deep application experience and knowledge. So those are just you know, some of the things I said. Like, If we have anything to offer other than just here's some workloads, I think it's this, um, we, we really take, take to heart the knowledge of the architect is someone who understands all pieces of it. And the application developer is someone who at least understands the properties of architecture in order to design better out. So we've always you know, loved the, the, the next thing in Grace. And over the next two worlds, I think you know, the, the, the two decades, the, the world's flipping around a little bit. It's always been about simulating everything that we could possibly want to describe. And I think now it's about observing and understanding anything that a human might want to observe or understand. And the compute density required to do that. Um, for a while there, a couple of years ago, we were kind of in a little bit of a malaise. Like, our pictures look really good, you know, <laughs> what are we going to do next? And uh, I'm not worried about resolution. I'm not worried about running out of pixels. I'm not running, worried about running out of compute anytime soon for a lot of these problems. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. And uh, I'll happy to take any questions. Right. Oh, and I'd like to, to thank all the, uh, the folks who work I, I uh, usurped here to show you guys. I actually didn't talk too much about mine. All right. Oh, here we go. Okay, Lauren. Oh, thanks a lot for a great talk. So I was sitting here listening to all this, and I'm, I'm really scared. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, so can you comment a little bit about uh, what would be the, the system's challenges to be able to do this in a way that's secure enough so that people feel comfortable? Oh, so we're talking about the last part. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sort of you know, push it to the limit when it comes to... I think it's a, a, a daunting and very interesting, uh, not just computer science challenge, but challenge in general. Um, and uh, I think that I think the first step is acknowledging that it's a huge issue. <laughs> um, and then the second part is, is really trying to figure out the stakeholders and trying your best to do the right thing. I mean, we don't have any answers, but um, we know that uh, the computer vision folks are going to really need to work with the privacy folks. And those groups are not working together right now. They absolutely need to be working together because. I feel a lot more comfortable with um, the guys down the hall trying to address this problem than, than Raytheon, to be honest. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't think there's any answers to this. Uh, I think like any other big technology, there are major potential benefits. There are major potential issues. Um, so, so no, I don't have a, an intelligent answer to that other than I don't want the ACLU at my doorstep either. Uh, yeah, well, Bobby asked my hard question, so I'll ask an easier question. Uh, so, uh, first is a comment. Uh, my car actually has the headlight avoidance uh, thing. Buy it from BMW okay. uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, but it doesn't do the snowflake thing, which is totally good. Yeah, that's true. The, the, they definitely do like the, the, the turn prediction. And they yeah, turn it. prediction, and, and I see a car, and so I won't shine in the mirror kind of thing. But, um, but I, I was kind of curious about the, the uh, parking spot uh, thing. And, and it, you know, kind of like, okay, great. How do I get my spot as opposed to Tom gets that spot? I mean, you know, how do we do the social aspects of, of you know, saying who gets the spot, you know, uh, in downtown Palo Alto or New York City? And, and, and then the second, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you're, if you're San Francisco, it's 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 on man pricing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then um, the second the second part of that question is in New York City. I'm pretty sure there isn't enough parking for cars that are certain. Yeah, I think that I actually, to be honest, I think that is a little bit of a short term uh, solution. Uh, Parking will not be an issue once we go to Tom. Um, but until we do, you know, mm -hmm. over the next two or three decades, uh, it would be very interesting to try and, and see uh, if if we can make U.S. cities run 50% uh, more efficient in terms of energy efficiency or pollution or this and that. Um, that is you know, huge, huge impact. Um, a friend of mine said that uh, the, the transportation evolution that's about to, to hit us is what he called the, the critical path of humanity, <laughs> right? And, and so if you're trying to figure out what to work on these days, then 
I like that, that metric is, is what I'm working on, sort of contributing to the critical path of, <laughs> of humanity. And I think after, uh, after spending a lot of time, or after this, our field has been um, entertainment and, and other, you know, other uh, games and, and other aspects of it, I think really being mainline in trying to evolve us to a, a happier state is, is exciting. But I think the questions you guys are bringing up are exactly why what do I work on? I work on a lot of optimizing compilers. I work on high performance image processing. But um, from a, you know, we, we always take, oh, we should take the systems view. Um, and I love architecting systems. Uh, this is one of the biggest systems that I've ever been faced to try and architect, and it's not just technical. And so I find it uh, very, uh, very interesting and, and important. So you're having fun. Sorry, God, very annoying. That was a great talk. Um, I was so surprised that robots didn't figure more in your talk. I mean, I know you talked about cars, but uh, yeah. you know, there's lots of reasons to believe that we'll have robots helping us do tons of stuff, which has a huge number of social consequences. That I'm not talking about those in terms of compute requirements. And so. Right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I had to draw scope somewhere, and I decided to 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 talk about the things I knew at least a little <laughs> about. <laughs> Um, I think that you could then, and I actually thought about this a whole lot, is do I then, I was trying to figure out how to factor the talk. Should I factor into people, cars, and cities, or should I factor it into navigation, social, and other things? I mean, you can think about the issues with robots as being a lot of the same issues with vehicles. They need to navigate. But you could also say that the issues with robots are all of the same issues I talked about with people, and that they're going to have to interact with people, especially healthcare robots and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, like my, 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 my work is I, I'm trying to make image processing as efficient as possible and develop new programming systems and frameworks so we can be productive and efficient uh, for both for image processes and 3D graphics. But I am enjoying trying to think a little bit about the implications of that now that those technologies are not just sitting behind the wall in the data center or in a gaming console. They are out into the real world and, as you say, have very powerful or very scary impacts on people's lives. So. You have to grow up a little bit. All right, so I have two people on the queue. Then, a quick context to each comment. Oh, and my colleagues at CMU, they would probably have started the whole time with robotics, too. <laughs> so that was sobering in terms of uh, the power per op. Uh, I guess my question for you is how much pain can you tolerate? <laughs> because we see no silver bullets that are going to uh, continue the barrage, or we're going to have to reveal some. Very Absolutely. exotic architectures that are going to require some very, very different ways of. of no problem at all. This is, this is a community that jumps on anything. Now, I think that the lines in the software stack need to be redrawn a little bit. And that, um, but this, this throwing your hands behind your back and saying, oh, how are people going to program this using traditional programming? is the thing that thankfully we have not done, is that I have not written code in a non-domain specific language uh, in a while. Um, one of my first year students, you know, I didn't actually talk too much about my work, but what, one of the things he did was there's a language out there that's in a domain IT called Halide, which is a domain specific language for image processing. Halide processes is used by Google to process most of the images that you upload to Google and in Google data centers. And you know, he, he developed an algorithm for automatically scheduling these Halide programs onto modern CPUs, GPUs, and ARM processors. And uh, just, you know, immediately, this is a student who was in his first year as a PhD. It's very possible that, you know, his first project that he first authored is going to be shipping in Google products in you know, six months before it's even in a conference. So if you have the right representations for the job, there's a lot that tools can do to help you. If you don't have the right representations for the job, <laughs> then all of a sudden things get really nasty. And I think that one thing that the, the limited domain scope has done for this community is it's made it possible to come up with the right representations that straddle the performance productivity boundary uh, effectively. And, and I absolutely uh, agree that there's no silver bullet. Um, a lot of this comes from algorithms, right? So it's not just like we're sitting here waiting for more flops. It's for every order of magnitude the architecture provides. There's an order of magnitude in understanding the structure of the problem better so that we can optimize things. 
And you're going to see that happen for sure with these deep networks. Because I think some of the most interesting stuff about deep networks is that how over-provisioned the state of the world is. You know, like Bill Daly has shown that you can remove 96% of the weights in a network and get the exact same answer. Right? So a lot of what these custom architectures are doing, and I'm not saying that you don't want those custom architectures, they're just processing redundancy faster. Right? If I find the structure and the problem, all of a sudden that workload becomes sparse, it becomes irregular, and so I'll have to make different trade-offs on what that architecture will look like. So, so it, we'll, we'll hit it from both ends. And I actually, I, I don't feel like this is a, I'm actually not, I don't feel very sober about it. I, I, think, we'll, I think we'll hit these targets. Uh, One final question. Max. So I can't help but think about the book 1984. Uh -huh. So how spontaneous do you think people will be when everybody can read your facial expressions and when say with oral words, the dictated screen is everywhere. I mean, uh, I wouldn't say that everybody can read your facial expressions. <laughs> it's not like this is being broadcast on Times Square. But um, I think like any technology, we're going to have to figure out what we're OK with. Um, if you said two decades ago that one single company in the world would own all of your electronic communications, you probably have said, no way in hell. Right? But there's a benefit you get from that. And people are always making a cost-benefit trade-off. If we do not offer benefits in exchange for loss of privacy, people will not use the stuff. If there are useful benefits, people will use the stuff. And that's, I think that's, that bears itself out of our history. Okay, so as I said before, uh, before we go through lunch, we're making some dynamic schedule changes here, uh, just due to timing. So uh, next up, we're going to hear from Yuan Jie uh, from UC Santa Barbara. So he's been you know, a member of our community for a long time, but he also has been working a lot on emerging technologies, new memory devices, and sort of some of the, the lower level stuff that we heard about from Philip earlier uh, uh, in the context of our community. And so he's going to tell us a little bit more about thinking about how technology is going to influence architectural research. And then after that, we will introduce the, uh, the breakout sessions and explain to you why we handed out a whole bunch of little numbers to all of you. If you haven't gotten a number, we'll tell you a little bit more on how to get one. All right, go ahead, you Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's always very tough to give a presentation after two great uh, keynote speeches, especially after the frequent ones uh, keynote speech and technology. Uh, so my original assignment was talking about technology and architecture from opportunity and challenge perspective, but it looks like that uh, free board already covered everything. <laughs> so we also did a dynamic task assignment, like, OK, over the, over the lunch time, so you, maybe you can talk about this from architect's perspective. So sort of like, a, kind of like a working on a new set of the styles. Like, instead of opportunity and challenge, let's look at something else. <laughs> so my title I changed a little bit. It's like, we, let's look at the past, present, and future. Okay. So one of the first things we, we always like to argue is, and by the way, one thing I would also want to share is that, okay, Fred Wong and I, we actually have a one at yeah, IBM. At that time, you worked for the device group. I worked for the design architecture group. At that time, we already saw like learning things from a device group on how to apply the things on uh, architecture and system design. So, so right now, what I, what I want to share is that, okay, first of all, many, you know, some, uh, always some arguments, okay, which community make a uh, more contribution to the computer that developed? Technological architecture, right? So the good thing is that oh, there's an article uh, back to uh, a few years ago saying, okay, the contribution is roughly equal. Okay. <laughs> so there's no argument. Okay, so basically, there's like architecture is like uh, about 80 percent, uh, 80 times more improvement over the last uh, uh, 30 years, right? Uh, on the other hand, when you look at technology and architecture, it has a uh, close and complicated uh, and by direction influence on each other. Okay. For example, the new characterization of new technology can affect the decision that can be made by the computer architects to design new uh, computer architecture. Uh, Philip Wong already gave some examples about that this morning. On the other hand, I also want to argue that okay, architect can also impact the ability of the technology. Okay. The technology could be great, but after we build architecture, and we may find something interesting and decide whether or not this technology could be uh, feasible, uh, applicable 
uh, uh, technology for the future. Okay? So one of the great articles that I actually look at the website is actually coming back to about 25 years ago, 1991. It's actually coming from uh, John Harris and Noam Chomsky. In that time, this article, they wrote this article to look at the interaction between the technology and architecture. And I thought it was very useful, and I would like to share with you the view in that particular article back to 25 years ago. So what they said in that article is that, okay, there are two major technology trends at the top. One is the uh, technology scaling, the transistor scaling, because smaller, faster, and, 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 and better, right? And the other trend is the increasing of the memory density. But these two technology trends actually bring two architecture trends at that time. One is that it enabled the process of architecture uh, improvement in terms of uh, pipelining, pipelining and instruction level comparison. And the other trend is to help the memory architecture in enable this multi-level caching and improve the performance of the architecture. Right? So this is a great article to talk about this trend. So the one of the interesting thing is that, okay, after this article uh, that has been 25 years, okay, uh, what happened during the last 25 years after this article was published? Right? So this today's workshop is about predicting the future. But for me, I think it's very difficult to predict the future. Maybe the best way to predict the future is to study the past, which is actually a quote from one famous author. Right? So what I was trying to do during the lunch time is say, OK, maybe what we can do is look at what happened during the last 25 years. And similar to what uh, Vincent Lee did this, this morning, the, the statistics about all this architecture conference, looking at all the art, uh, topics, I actually also my student did a quick study looking at the last 25 years for ISCA only, only look at topics. Okay. So what, what, what's, uh, what, what, what was in, uh, published in the last 25 years in ISCA only? So let's look at the topics. The first thing is that, okay, a lot of papers actually talking about process of design. Yeah, indeed, that's uh, computer architecture, no problem at all. But the second thing is about memory, right? So what you can see is there's a trend looking at all these topics published in uh, computer architecture. So, <laughs> The memory becomes more and more important, and for for after like say for example like after two thousand eight, I still remember there was the ISCA in Beijing two thousand eight, and at that time we saw a lot of uh, papers on cache and memory. So one joke at that time I heard is that okay ISCA is standing for International Symposium on Cache Architecture. <laughs> so you can see that right now it's like the memory, the topic of memory is actually more than the topic of the process itself. But if you look at further, you can see that, okay, starting from 2000, okay, interconnect becomes very important when you put so many transistors on chip, and so many functionality on chip, right? So therefore, we have seen a lot of very interesting articles looking at the network on chip and the interconnect architecture. And furthermore, you can also see that the GPU architecture becomes a hot topic after 2008. And recently, this kind of uh, specialized accessory to architecture has a quick increase in terms of the number of the papers in the architecture community. So as a summary, you can see that today is the community with the topics that we cover in terms of processor, memory, interconnect, GPU, and accessory. And on the other hand, if I, if I look at the optimization goal, say, when you design architecture, what do you optimize for? One of the interesting things you can see that the performance is always the, optimi uh, the, 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 the top target to do the optimization. But 2000, Year 2000 is an interesting starting point. In that particular year, you can see that uh, David Brooks from Princeton, at that time he was my uh, office mate in Princeton, he was working on like, a uh, watch stuff. And in that particular year, watch and symbols, symbol power from Penn State, I mean, they were publishing <coughs> in 2000 and actually stimulated a lot of research following up, looking at optimization for power and energy. And the other interesting thing is about the reliability. So as, as you put more transistors on chip and the transistors become smaller, one of the important topics is how to build a reliable architecture or a type of unreliable components, right? So power and reliability becomes an interesting in topic since year 2000, right? So these are all these trends, when you look at it, it's all because of the CMOS technology scaling. When you have smaller transistor, you can put more transistor on chip, but those transistor becomes leaky, becomes unreliable, and therefore it, it actually stimulates all these new trends in the our architecture community. But like what we learned from early this morning, okay, technology, seamless technology will not scale anymore, right? So one of the interesting trends is looking at emerging technology. So if you look at those topics in the last 15 years, you can see that in our computer architecture community, in ISCA in particular, we have seen these are 
emerging technology topics like 3D dye stacking, you know, one time model photonics, and quantum computing, and so on, right? So these are one not in the uh, proceeding at all before 2004. But with this kind of statistic, about one thing I want to argue is that, okay, even though the new technology, emerging technology can affect our decision, it can actually help us to design new architecture. On the other hand, the development in architecture can also impact the reliability of the <coughs> technology itself. So I would like to use one technology that I'm very familiar with as a case study to show you the environment uh, in the last 15 years. That's the three integration. So three integration was actually been studied like uh, uh, a long time ago. So for example, when I was in IBM, 2000, year 2002, I was IBM, I was in IBM at that time, IBM was doing that demonstrate the technology feasibility of putting two wafers together and building a TSV going through that. So with that, actually my friend, Gabriel, I don't know whether he's here, Gabriel and Brian Black, we're actually looking at different poss possible ways to re-architect the microprocessor, and building these uh, 3D dice stacking microprocessors. And as a matter of fact, industry also picked up, for example, the Intel had to ICCD 2004, they show this uh, Pentium 4 building in two layers, fine grain reality, single core microprocessor. And then in 2006, okay, my group published this uh, first architecture, 3D architecture printing in uh, and showing that combining 3D technology together with uh, NLC technology, we can enable this uh, fast uh, multi core architecture design. And the next year, Intel showed prototyping, showing that, okay, combine 3D and NLC, they can enable this many core design, enable very fast memory uh, bandwidth between the logic layer and memory layer. But when you look at the history, it's like 2004, 2007, Intel has this product. But what happened after that? It didn't have any product. So in the year 2010, Gabe and I got an assignment from Ice Cream Michael saying that, hey, you guys are working on 3D architecture. Intel has this in 2004, 2007. But what happened? There's no products out there. So we actually look at these uh, technologies, okay, interesting. What are the factors that affects this adoption of this new technology? In fact, it's not just about technology feasibility, it's also having some other factors like cost and also business model and so on. And therefore we said, okay, one possible way is to step back instead of doing true 3 d integration, let's do 2.5D integration. In that way we can decouple the design of the microprocessor and the memory cell to put this uh, stack memory close to the CPU or GPU. Okay? So therefore we started looking at this uh, new architecture. Instead of true 3D integration, that we look at 2.5D uh, integration. And we use GPU as an example uh, to look at the benefit of high bandwidth going between this uh, stack memory and the GPU. And interestingly, uh, last year, AMD finally made it, made it to the product, and the Fury X is actually using this technology is actually having 2.5D plus 3D memory to be the first generation of the GPU with the student stack now. And Pasco was announced this early this year by NVIDIA. So it's also doing the similar things as stack memory sitting right next to the GPU. And Intel also has an interesting uh, announcement about nice landing. Okay. So when you look at this uh, history, one of the interesting timelines, like, okay, at the beginning technology was developed, okay, and people got excited about it. And looking at a single core design, fine granular uh, uh, design, but it didn't take off because of this benefit. It doesn't justify all these uh, investment in terms of redesign this uh, microprocessor. And then later in 2006, we look at multi core. In 2007, we see that the multi core 3D stacking is there, not type. But because of business model and cost issue, we switch to 2.5D. And 2.5D also get, gets the help from the memory vendors where they build the HMC and HPM. And finally, last year, we see the product has to be integration. So you can see the technology architecture interaction here is that technology is out there, but architecture design also help to fine tune the right options to use this uh, technology. Okay. Now, forward, uh, look forward in the future, I think that the emerging non runtime memory would be one of the key important non runtime uh, technology that can help us to redesign the microarchitecture. Like what uh, Frequent One already mentioned, I think that opportunity and challenges are out there. And uh, in fact, in our community, we already study these uh, activity and challenges. And I believe that this could be one of the most important technology after 3D that can actually shape our uh, future microarchitecture design. And just follow up the 
previous keynote speech, I think that emerging application also play a very important role in terms of future computer architecture. For example, this is actually some of the uh, statistics that I look at the last several years. Uh, uh, ISCA. Uh, what, what you can see is that mobile embedded data center and also AI and machine learning applications, these are actually appear in our ISCA uh, conference and showing a quick increase of the interest itself. For example, the AI application, machine learning application, I think this is one of the most interesting applications that can drive our community to look at different things. And personally, I believe that emergent architecture combined uh, emerging application plus emerging technology could actually help us to come up with this emerging architecture. And as one of the example, one of my students will actually present our uh, paper. It's actually combined emerging application and emerging device for this emerging processing uh, in memory architecture. And overall, I think that this is, uh, if you look at the last 25 years, one of the interesting things you can see here is that uh, I try to classify the papers that architecture driven, that's like a traditional architecture papers, and application driven papers, and also technology driven papers in ISCA. One of the interesting things you can see that, okay, our classical architecture papers continue to be stable, but we see an increase in terms of the technology driven paper, and application driven paper, and one of the interesting things you can see that this year, okay, a technology driven paper and application driven paper is the same uh, in terms of the number. And combined together, you can see that we, we accept more papers. Part of the reason, I think, that they are actually open to the application driven and technology driven papers. Okay. Now, as a conclusion, I will show is so far what you see is that a lot of our community architecture innovations is currently in the ISCA community. It's like, okay, we look at the application, new application. Data center was not there back to the 90s. Mobile embedded was not there back to the 90s. And AI was actually just coming up okay, in the last couple of years. And technology-driven innovation is actually coming from traditional technology scaling that creates a lot of problems such as uh, reliability, power, processing variation, and emerging technology like 3D and emerging long-time memory also helped us to come up with new ideas for new architectures. And looking forward, I think that in the future, uh, I think application will play a very, very important role in, in our research. For example, neuromorphic computing and the one that uh, the previous keynote just mentioned VR, AR applications that can also give us more uh, interesting application drivers to come up with new architectures. And in terms of emerging technology, I think that in addition to 3D and also now runtime memory, optical interconnect, and some other post seamless technology could also give us uh, interesting ideas to come up with uh, emerging architecture. Okay. Thank you very much. Questions for you. Thanks for the great talk. This is more of a general question, not just like you. I'm just going to try to, to put your head out of there and, and see what the community thinks. So if you look at what we do, is we, we take these new technologies and we take the new applications. And at the end of the day, we write things that have to do with something about architecture. A new architecture, new valuation, better new something. Other communities have gone different ways. For example, I've been going a lot to systems, uh, operating systems conference recently, and they've said, let's take these great applications and do whatever it is. And maybe they have a session on kernels these days, and it's typically hard on people, people in the papers there. But all the other papers are great papers that have nothing to do with the operating system. For example, you go there and you listen to OSDI, you listen to the spanner paper, which is a geo distributed database. I have no idea what operating systems do with this. It's a fantastic paper, which solves a fantastic problem. <laughs> Should we go that way and just say there's this new great application that somebody pointed out and we'll do whatever it is? If it's hardware, great, but if there's nothing about hardware, it's GPS uh, based uh, database or you know, something, we'll do it. How about that? I, I think that's a, I think this is not just for me, it's actually for the whole community. Yeah, <laughs> right. so you get to give the first answer. <laughs> I would say you, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I think my personal opinion is that it, uh, for these uh, great applications, if we can use the existing architecture, existing hardware to do that, uh, just like the system level in the world innovation, definitely that would be cool already. So we don't really need to like uh, come up with. Uh, New hardware architecture to do these kind of things if we can have an existing solution to do that. For example, the VIAR stuff, 
is uh, one interesting application, right? So if the column existing GPU and uh, CPU architecture can handle all this latency and data high high bandwidth of the uh, memory bandwidth requirement, I think that's perfectly fine. It's just that right now when you look at VRA application, I think that the users still have concern about the hardware capabilities not able to catch up with their personal perspective, and therefore we have opportunity in there to come up with new architecture. That's my personal opinion. All right, let's, uh, let's thank you on again. Right. This has been great, thank you. So now we are gonna do a breakout session, um, and just a few logistics. First, uh, what's the discussion topic? We wanna keep it simple, every single group, will be five groups, and we're gonna talk about assignments in a minute. So we want everyone to discuss uh, a grand challenge slash big idea for the Apache community. Okay, we want to articulate, you know, a short description that's accessible to broader computer science. Uh, we want you to discuss what is the what is expected benefit if successful, if the idea is successful, if the challenge is met. Uh, how doing it push the field forward, and also which related disciplines will we draw from, like programming languages, OS, machine learning, etc., and how. What do you draw from that to you? Yeah, so, so again, remember, kind of inspired by what, what Mark said, for those of you who are in the, uh, at the very beginning, uh, you know, in his meta presentation of how the Architecture 21st Century paper works, our objective is to take the report outs that you're now going to produce collaboratively in these breakout sessions, you know, in slide form, size from them in some kind of follow-up activity with the community, write up that we can use to market why architecture is important outside of architecture. And so what we're looking for is, what are those ideas? What is the story that we can tell about why the investment in the architecture community should double in you know, the next 15 years? Uh, and you know, so grand challenge is sort of our hook to try to get you to think in that way. So remember, here, that's the goal. And here are two examples just to get your uh, you know, mind juices going. The first one is one recent one by DARPA on smart spectrum allocation that I thought was a great example. So the idea here is, you know, can we actually set up partitioning the spectrum a priori, which is how it's done today? Can we have this, the devices allocate a chunk of the spectrum dynamically? That's a huge problem. Not clear it can be done. But anyways, it's, if it works, it's going to push algorithms forward, radio form forward. There's a lot of computing involved. There's a lot of this we have to get together to make this work. Here's another example, the DARPA self-driving uh, car in urban settings that was done in 2007. It was actually it was a successful team. And that, I would say, arguably, actually, the pushing the excitement and showing that it's actually feasible to think about self-driving cars, okay? Um, all right, logistics. Uh, we want you guys to prepare a five-minute report out. Um, I sent an email with a link to a widely open Google Slides that I, I'm happy to see people already hacking. That's the beauty of, you know, online collaboration tools. Uh, so there is, like, uh, slides for the five groups, okay? So there's a little template there, do whatever you want, as long as you stay within your group. And it's nice so that you can see what other groups are doing. So we want diversity in the end. You know, please be creative. Uh, we also assign leaders that will be probably be the report outs to uh, the, the reporters. Uh, by the way, do all of you guys have a number? So, if you, so if you have not received a number, come find Ashish. She has numbers. The purpose of the numbers here is to ensure that you're randomly assigned to groups. We're trying to break all the traditional social networks of the architecture <laughs> community <laughs> and force people to talk in a uh, 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 sort of people that perhaps you haven't talked to before. Okay, so a few more things before you go on the break. Uh, so Raz Bodek is one of the leaders. Raz, this is your room. So people see you with Raz. And then Joe, Emmer, where are you, Joe? Right there. Right there, so Joe is gonna lead group number two. Joe, you can get the first room on the right getting out here. So there's one room per group, okay? And then Sarita, right there. So you're gonna read, uh, she's gonna lead group number three. You take the second room going that direction. Okay, uh, and then Babak, inductively, you take the third room going that direction, and David Wood, right here, leading group number five, you take the last room on the hallway. Last room. Okay, the and right. everyone back here at five o'clock, and yeah. please use, again, use the Google Slides because we're gonna project from my laptop for quick content. So, so there's coffee upstairs, so we would encourage you to go get coffee first for 10 to 15 minutes, but try to report to these rooms no later than 3.45, we want you to have an hour and 15 minutes to discuss, generate some ideas, and actually produce uh, a meaningful report out. Report out promptly at 5. Don't be late. I come chase you all back in here so we have time to see it. Thank you, everybody, and thank you to those on the live stream. We're going to cut off the live stream now. Thank you. Bye.